So I got home from vacation yesterday. This is my normal color now. It's called tan, and I'm okay with that. Uh, I got home from vacation to a water leak and a son's loss. And so I'm just saying this morning, devil, not today. Not today. Not today. It's funny because four years ago, the very day I got home from vacation, I came home to a water leak. And four years later, I come home to a water leak. It's time to move. Right? All right, so we're continuing in our, our book, uh, uh, a series called uh, The Book of Acts, Activate. We're going to talk about Acts chapter 2 a little bit today. And last week, Pastor Tim spoke a little bit about um, just the beginning of what happened at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit arrived upon the disciples and the apostles, and uh, they got the wind that came through the building, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to kind of pick up in that story a little bit this morning, this morning. So the original church was a movement gathered around a mission. The mission came first. The mission was given in Acts 1, which we talked about, and God doesn't have a mission for the church. Matter of fact, he has people. He made the church for his mission. Let me repeat that. God doesn't have a mission for the church. He made his church for the mission. Right? So what happens is a lot of us, we come to church thinking this is God's mission. No, 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 no. You are God's mission. That's what we're going to learn through Acts chapter 2. And I remember this as a little kid when I was, uh, went to church. If you grew up going to church or uh, if you grew up a heathen, you'd still probably remember this. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open it up. See all the, what heresy they taught me. <laughs> Complete heresy. Because this is a building. And matter of fact, I'm reminded this last week that this building leaks when it's monsoon season. This building will crumble one day, so this is not the church. We're going to find out through the book of Acts, really, the church is us. That's the church. You see, what we understand is Acts 1 shows us two very things that propel us through the movement of the book of Acts. And here's the two very things. If you get nothing more from the book of Acts, get this right here. The first thing is they were captured by a message. They were captivated by this message. And then they yielded to the Spirit. They were captured by a message, and then they yielded to the Spirit. That's the whole idea. And so my question as we begin this morning, have you been captured by the message that which the first apostles received? And it was the message that Jesus Christ died, was risen from the grave for us to live in eternity celebrating the goodness of Jesus Christ. That was the message. They captivated them. It changed their lives. And then then here's the crazy thing what these guys did, is they yielded to what the Holy Spirit said. It didn't say, well, God's come. I'm going to just be captivated by the message and do nothing. They had to do something with what they learned. And so one of my prayers is as a church is that we become a spirit-filled church. And I'm not talking about running around with snakes on the ground and stuff like that, although that would be Arizona. Um, (laughs) What I'm talking about is that we'd be so captured by what Jesus has done that we wouldn't be able to contain it that we'd be yielded, that means, that means we'd be submitted to what God has called us to do. That's my prayer as a church, as we look at our whole church, that we become a spiritful church that in the book of Acts. You see, there was a, there's a number in the book of Acts. If you read Acts chapter 1, I'm going to give you a little bit of refresher. Peter preaches, and 3,000 people get saved, the first message. You see, what, what, it's significant because this, the law was given back in the Old Testament to 3,000 people, and 3,000 people who did not obey the law died. Instantly. And and so what happened, and you see in Acts chapter 1, is that there's this great passage in where there's tongues of fire on their head, over their heads of these people who are gathered in this room. And and this idea was, and and this is where we're going to move to Acts chapter 2, the idea was, in the Old Testament, Fire was a representation of God's presence, and it was, ref- it was only confined to a temple building. And so we're going to see this activation of what God wants to do through the Holy Spirit, because what he did in Acts chapter 1, and Acts, the beginning of Acts chapter 2, is he takes this tongue of fire, this imagery of fire, and he says, no longer is it in the temple. And he now places it above people's heads, and he gives them this scripture. He says, now you are the temple of the body of Jesus Christ. You see, God moved the barrier from him and and people just residing in a building, and he put it in the lives of us. And he says, now I've got a mission for those I've given my life to. 
And so we're going to jump into Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and this is the mission in which he's given us, and I love it. Now, there, here it is, Acts chapter 2, 42. Now, here's a description of the first church, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is what they did when they gathered. To the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Devoted, they gave themselves to, they abandoned everything else unselfishly. They devoted themselves. You see, we don't really understand the word devotion anymore. What we understand is the word association. Now check this out. I guarantee you all agree with me. How many of you ever started a diet? Come on. A thousand times, right? And you are devoted to that diet for like the first two days. Right? You got the Weight Watcher app on your phone. You're calculating your points. Come on now. How many of you paid $10 a month and you're still paying? Right? You know what I'm talking about. You were devoted. You were gung-ho. You went through your cabinets, cleared out all the junk, right? Ate it. <laughs> Maybe. You cleared out all the junk because you had in your mind the end result of being devoted to something was going to be great. It was worth the pain until, until your wife comes home from the grocery store with these sinful little things called Chips Ahoy. <laughs> now, this is day two of my diet. Well, we, I got to feed the kids something. This is the kid that gets fed to something. She comes home with these sinful things of, I don't even know what's in them, but pure goodness of God. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm devoted to my diet. I'm devoted. And then I go into the refrigerator, and it gets worse, Right? It gets worse. I go into my refrigerator and just, just randomly disappears. Now, what's a man to do when you got these two things staring at you? And you're devoted to Jenny Craig. You're devoted to Weight Watchers. You're devoted to whatever it is, 30 this month. To keto. Cheeto. That's what I've been devoted to. That's what I've been devoted to is Cheetos. And my devotion to my diet is now become an association because I'm looking at something that's so much better than a devotion to, to Weight Watchers. I'm watching my weight, but I'm watching it do the wrong thing. And then I go into my cabinet, and I'm like, oh, no, something else. <sighs> you woman God gave me. Praise God. And then I go into my cabinet or something else. I, I mean, how many of you love Chips Ahoy? Let's just be honest. Anybody love Chips Ahoy? All right, Kevin, come on up, man. Come on. You can't look at Chips Ahoy and not dip them. It's impossible. Pop a squat, sit down. You might be up here the whole time. You can eat the whole package. No, no, no. This is devotion. We're going to be devoted to Chips Ahoy right now. We're not going to be associated with them. We're going to, look at, lift. And it's the party size. I'm not doing it. Yes, not you are. You got to eat the whole thing, man. Here you go. Let's sit down. Let's have a little no. chat around some milk and cookies this morning. Come on. It's not the enemy. Have a seat. Now, listen. You got you to you hold it exactly for 10 seconds. One, two, three. Now, listen. I was devoted to, to Weight Watchers. I cleaned out my cabinets. I had a mission. I knew that. That's 10. Hey, too much is going to crumble. Then you got to dig your fingers in there. Nobody wants your fingers in your mouth. How good is that? That's good. Uh, that's real good. Hold on. <laughs> now, I would much rather be associated to Weight Watchers or my diet at this time. But devotion means I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to sacrifice. That's the word devotion. And when, it, when the scripture talks about the apostles were devoted the, the people were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to, to, the, to gathering together, to breaking of bread, to the prayers. When they were devoted, that means they didn't associate with something else. That means they, they, they looked at the milk and they looked at the cookie and they said, no matter what, this is what I'm going for. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> you don't want more? No. I'm telling you, bro. Gotta wash it down. 
The beauty is I bought the party pack so I can cheat all week. You see, we understand association in our culture. Think about it. How many, let's be, let's be honest, let's show of hands, let's, let's understand the difference right now. How many of you have been devoted to a diet or to a resolution for more than a week? How many of you failed after week one? Because something better came along, right? I mean, that's the premise of addiction. So we understand this idea of association, and I think what happens in the church today, and we're going to look at Acts 2 right now, is we've become incredible at associating with Jesus Christ, but not being devoted to him. Like, I want to be called a Christian. I want the benefits of God. I just don't want to give the sacrifice to God. You see, when I'm devoted to something, means I will sacrifice whatever it is to reach this goal. But association means whatever best comes along next is going to get my attention. That which I started out so faithful, so devoted, like I knew I wanted to change, I knew I wanted something better. But as soon as something else piques my senses, my association changes. The word definition of a devotion, check this out. To love, to be loyal to, have enthusiasm for a person, an activity, or a cause. Let me just say it this way. Devotion is to have enthusiasm, excitement, a, a, a commitment, a loyalty to a cause. You see, the first church they understood is they had a devotion to God. They were enthused about what God was doing. They were devoted to the activity of God. They were devoted to the cause of the Holy Spirit and what he was going to do. And that's where we pick it up, Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to the prayers. The first thing we see is they were a devoted to the apostles' teaching. What does that mean? You see, our culture says this. Our culture is very simple. It says, find the truth within you. If it feels good to you, then it must be truthful. But that's a different message than what God gives us. The word says this. As a matter of fact, it says in Deuteronomy 6. You see, what we have is, we have to understand that Christianity is a word-based relationship. God reveals himself through words or through the book, through the Bible. And think about it. In Deuteronomy 6, these words I've commanded you today... You are to have them upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and speak to them in your home. And when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, and as a reminder, tie the, a bind around your finger, around your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your home and on your gate. You see, it's hard to be devoted to something you don't know. You see, the first thing these guys did, and here's why it's important, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching because they knew the other three things that they devoted themselves to were worthless unless they started with step one. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching because they knew that this was the source of truth. Because to be honest, sometimes this is not the source of truth. This was the source of truth. Whether they liked it or not, this was the source of truth. You see, that's devotion. Devotion says, I'm going to stick to the diet regardless if I like it or not. Regardless if I like what it says or not. Because I know that the benefit is at the end. I know that the benefit comes through the pain. I know that the benefit of being devoted to something, I will see the results later. But i got to be honest, friends. Association, man, that's where a lot of us live. You see, they knew it. They were devoted to it. They trusted it. You can't be devoted to something you don't know. Being committed, taking off the blinders, and seeing everything clearly as it is written. And i got to be honest this morning. There are things written in here I don't like. Like, be kind to your children all the time. I don't like that. I'm just kidding. But there are things in here I don't like. Why? Because it goes against what I like. But that didn't matter for these guys. They were devoted. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. You see, we've become people who are really not devoted anymore. We've become associated because association is convenient. So I have to ask you this morning, as we look in the book of Acts, how devoted are you to the apostles' teaching lately? It's a great question. Now, it's pretty simple these days because you have an app. You can pop it up and you can read it anytime you want. You can be devoted to the apostles' teaching. So I'm just going to challenge you right now. I'm going to give you some applications as we go this morning. The first step in the first application is remember what it's like to be devoted to the, to the apostles' teaching. And I'm going to challenge you this. Pick up the word of God three times this week. Not seven, because you're going to fail, and then you're never going to do it again. I know psyche. Three times. Five minutes. Fifteen minutes devotion. 
read something of God's word and let the truth of God seep in so that no matter what, that I can start to say, God, I want to be devoted to you. I don't necessarily understand it. You see, the word of God is simple. It's just not simplistic. Simplistic means it'd be easy to follow. Simple is easy to understand. It's complex to follow. It's hard to follow. It requires that I must sacrifice something. It requires that I must change something. It requires that life doesn't revolve around me. Be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Friends, we are great at being devoted to our teachings, aren't we? But to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Then it goes on. See, the rest of these things start to play out once they're devoted to the apostles' teaching. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. I love this word, fellowship. They devoted themselves. They gave themselves. You see, a group of people made a covenant, official covenant, and then they organized as a church. It was not the church and then the people came. It was these people said, together we're going to take care of one another. This term fellowship is the word koinonia. It's a Greek word. This word appears 19 times in the New Testament. And guess what it never says? It never says we got together for coffee and bagels. You see, that's what the American church and we think fellowship is, is I'll have coffee and, no offense, day-old bagels out in the lobby. And boy, man, if that coffee is not right coffee, then forget it. Fellowship was terrible today. Right? Fellowship. Here's what it says in the Bible. It says these words. It says they shared, they participated, they contributed. That's fellowship. Sharing, participating, contributing. One of the, thank you, I appreciate that. Contribute. One of the reasons we don't see the kingdom of God is because we're not devoted to this. God is in, is, is in check this out, God is in the business of bringing people to different groups where he knows he can trust those people that he's bringing to that they'll take care, that they'll share, and that they'll participate in life with them. That's what God does. I learned a long time ago that every one of you are here for a reason. Now, many of us think that the reason I'm here is to what God wants to do in my life, and I, I, I don't doubt that. But I've learned a long time ago, and haven't been in the church world for a long time, is it's not what God wants to do in me. You are here for a reason, and this is why. Because you have something to share, participate, or contribute that someone else in this building needs, and God is trusting you to meet the need for somebody else. Now, if you don't show up to meet that need, if you don't participate, if you don't contribute, guess whose need doesn't get met? Not yours, theirs. You see, you are not here by accident. God has a plan for your life, and he's brought you to this group, this assembly, this mission-oriented people so that you could share and participate because what you have is vitally important, not to the building, but it's important to someone else here in the building. That's the importance of church. You have to bring something because someone needs something. That's the key. key. And what you bring, no matter if it's time, talent, treasure, experience, no matter what it is, someone will be left out if you don't participate and contribute. That's just the way it works. You see, the mission is not focused on what we receive, but it's focused on what we give. That's what the scripture says. They were in fellowship. They participated. They shared. They contributed. It never says they gathered. They withheld. They they earned. It's the opposite. It was a giving away of these things that led to, to the growth. They devoted themselves to these things. I love that. It continues. Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers together had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Let me ask you a question real fast. We'll continue with the verse in a minute. Anyone have a, a, they they sold their possessions. Anybody Anybody short on cash this week? Just be honest. Say, yeah, I'm struggling. Just, just, all right, cool. Thank you. Anybody have any extra cash this week? Anybody have any extra cash this week? My wife has some. (laughs) This I did not know. I don't know where she's getting it from, and I don't know where she's storing it from. All right, let me get your extra cash then. Hey, I thought it was like for me. Let me get your extra cash. It's her Botox fund. I didn't say it. She said it. All right, check this out. This is how the church is supposed to work. Somebody had something. They gave it. They were willing to contribute something so that somebody else in need was no longer in need. 
That's sharing, that's participating, that's contributing to what the mission is. Now let me tell you this, no, no, don't applaud, this is important. This is important. Why would not God bring more people to this mission if people received and, re and gave that way? Because he knows he could trust us as people to be willing to say, whatever it is, God, it's yours for the sake of your glory, not mine. Do you see what I'm saying? That's how the church grew. It didn't grow by a marketing plan. It grew by God saying, I can trust you to take care of people. That's how the church grew. Whew, I'm sweating up here. They devoted themselves to this. Every day they continued to meet in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes together. They ate with sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying favor. And the Lord, the marketing plan of the church building, added to their numbers daily. No, no, no. Everybody, who, who added to the numbers? The Lord added to the numbers when? Once a year? Christmas and Easter? Daily. Daily. They met in big groups. They met in small groups. Together, there's 3,000. But verse 46 says, day by day, they went in places together. They broke bread together. They ate in homes together. Who's, who's inviting me for dinner tonight? I'm tired of cooking. The word together appears over and over and over in this verse. Together, they praised God. You see, that's us. We're a big group, but we're a big group comprised of small groups. That's the point. A big group is a battalion. They can conquer things. A small group, what do they do? They take care of things. That's the point. That's why we talk about small groups around here all the time. It's not because we like to do more things. It's because we're trying to live out and be responsible to what? The apostles' teaching. That's the point. They devoted themselves to each other. You see, I love my men's Wednesday night group. By the way, it's an open invitation when we resume in the next couple weeks. Men's, uh, every Wednesday night we meet here. I love my men's group because we are living out what this passage says, I believe, to the fullest extent, and that's why God keeps adding to those numbers. We've had guys who have come in and said, I'm short on finances this week, and guess what? Another guy steps up and says, no problem, I got you covered. What do you need? We've had guys come in here and say, I'm having trouble in my marriage. Guess what happens? Another guy asks them out to coffee to hang out and be, share life together, to participate, to contribute. What does that take? It takes sacrifice. We've had guys come in and say, I can't afford a men's retreat. I've had another guy step up and say, I can't go to the men's retreat, but I can afford to go, so let me take care of it for you. We've had guys come in who have been sick or who've had surgery, and other guys show up and bring meals to their house. Men bringing meals. Barbecue, of course. Truthfully, we've had a gentleman come in our group and that evening plan to kill himself. Had the letters written. And other guys gathered around him and said, I'm going to participate, I'm going to contribute, and I'm going to be a part of your pain and your struggle right now. And now, this guy's happily married and loving life. You see, that's the stuff that God says, I can trust you because you've shown you've given. You've shown you contributed. You've shown you participated. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring you even more sick people who need to be a part of being healed again because that's what the message and the gospel of Jesus Christ does. Is it heals people. Whew. I believe that's why God keeps bringing more guys into our Wednesday night group. Let me ask you a question. Are you devoted to fellowship or are you associated with Christ? Some of you here have been associated for way too long. And, and, and you're missing out, not on what God wants to give you for what you get, but you're missing out what he's planted in you to give. It's like Christmas, right? As a kid, you love getting. Love it. Love it. Love Christmas morning. Wrapping, running down, opening the presents. But as a parent, you love getting. No, I'm kidding. You... As a, as a parent, what do you do on Christmas morning? You sit back and you watch your kids open up presents, and you're like, man, this is better than getting myself. That's the idea of what God means when he says that believers were gathered together sharing possessions. They were devoted to this fellowship. They were not just associated to it. Acts 2.42. And then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread. Now, what does that mean? That's a, spe a specific term, because in this passage, and he uses this term twice, the breaking of bread twice in Acts 2.42 through 47. The first time, there's a proper noun. There's, a, there's a, a word that comes in front of it. The word the means a representation of something specific. That word the makes it then a, 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 a specific noun. And it's the breaking of bread, which means communion. 
Now, later on in this passage, this is pretty interesting to know, you're going to see the word breaking of bread again, but that is in reference to sharing meals together, sharing life together. So there's a distinction between the two breaking of bread, specifically. So what is he saying about this breaking of bread? He's being very interesting. They were devoted to worship. To the worship. You see in verse 42, they were devoted to the breaking of bread. The Lord's table was a special time in which Jesus promised to be present in a different way. That's why we celebrate communion here. He was present in worship. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10. He says that we are participating in the presence of Christ itself when we celebrate it. They devoted themselves to that. They also believed that the Spirit of God was on each of them. Paul would later explain in this passage, he would say this. He said that when they would gather together, the Spirit of God would give words. Check this out. That it says later on in Acts, if you keep reading, and Paul says this. He says they would give words. They would come and words and insights would be given to them for others. That's what he's saying. When they gathered together in this worship context, people didn't receive messages just for themselves. God wanted to impart something for them to give away to someone else. They went with an expectation that they were going to hear from God that day. Not that they were going to hear from God that day for them. That they were going to hear that day from God for someone else. They came together expecting to be in the presence of God. Let me ask this question. What did you come here expecting them to get this morning? You see, this is the mindset that has to change about us as we look and try to behave like the apostles' teaching says. As we come to church, what am I going to get out of it? Man, I didn't like to worship this morning. I'm great because I wasn't worshiping you, right? We come with this idea of what am I going to get today? How many of us walked in these doors with the thought of what am I going to give today? What is it that God has implanted in my spirit? What is the word that I'm going to sit? What is the knowledge that I'm going to sit? What is the prayer I'm going to sit that God wants me to give to someone else? Because that's what they did. They came expecting God to move, not on their behalf, but on the behalf of somebody else. And they were just there to say, God, be my, let me be the tool to do it. Let me be the tool to do it. I can't tell how many people have left churches, our church, other churches, because they didn't like the music or they didn't like the day-old bagels. I like day-old bagels. You toast them, they taste the same. Right? Because they didn't get what they wanted. Why is it that we live in such a Christian culture that says, if I don't get what I want, I'm going to take my ball and go home? Versus, I'm here because God wants to use me to give to somebody else. That's the idea. That's the idea. They were devoted to this. They were devoted to the breaking bread communion. It's a reminder. See, communion is simple. Why did they devote themselves to this? Because it was, a devo- it was a reminder of the positional relationship. That the, he is God, and so I'm reminding myself continually. That's why they did this. They reminded themselves continually by the taking of the elements, the bread and the juice, or the bread and the wine, that God is God and I am not. I need reminders of that. How many of us need reminders of that often? They devoted themselves to this. For God has done so much for them that they had to continually, uh, uh, you know, let me be honest, like life gets in the way sometimes and, and sometimes I don't remember that God has done so much for me and so I need a physical reminder to align my heart, my soul, and my mind back to the idea of what God has done for me. That's why they devoted themselves to this, because they wanted to make sure the position was right. You see, watch the linear progression here. But they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching. We're going to do what it says, and what it says is share with one another, love one another, be kind to one another. So they participate in that. And then it says, uh, you know, we go back to the commandments. I have no other God before me. So now they're positioning themselves in this deal. And they continue. Acts 2.42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. They devoted themselves to prayers. They prayed all the time. When someone got in trouble, they prayed. When someone had a need, they prayed. When someone was sick, they prayed. When they were scared, they prayed. You see all through the book of Acts this theme around God's word and prayer. You can tell someone's devotion to prayer. You can tell someone's spiritual temperature in their life and how much time they give to prayer. Just being honest. You know what? When I'm loving myself and my filth and my sin... Guess what's the first thing to leave my life? Prayer. Like, I can serve great. I can give great. But that positional relationship I have with God that says, God, I'm going to submit myself to you and I'm going to talk to you like my buddy, guess what breaks off? Prayer. It's no different than a relationship. Guess what happens when my wife and I are in a fight? Guess who doesn't want to talk? Me. 
right? When I know I've done something wrong or I, or I know that we're at an odds, it's just like an earthly relationship, this idea of prayer. It says, I don't want to talk to you if we're not in one accord or if you don't agree with me all the time, which happens a lot in my house, usually because I'm wrong. Interesting. You, you know, it's, it's funny, two things I'll say. One is the, be, the, the, the craziest, most random time in our church every year is usually the first weekend in January. And it's when we do something called 24 hours or we did 12 hours of prayer. We stopped doing 24 because no one came at 24. We thought they'd come at 12. And you know what? A couple of people show up at 12 hours. So now we're just going to do 10 minutes of prayer. See, imagine only talking to your spouse when you needed something. Imagine only talking to your spouse when you felt like it or your kids when you needed them to do something. You see, their utter dependence and devotion showed up not just in how they served one another, not just in how they were devoted to this. Their utter dependence on God showed up in their need to communicate with him, to worship him, to communicate. Prayer is simply this, saying, God, I trust you. I trust you enough that I'm willing to talk to you. Uh, a, a study went out, has recently come out. It talks about the individualistic culture that we have and that has influenced um, our, our, our spiritual lives. You know, this is a communal, Acts 2.42 is communal. They were together in a community. It says this, 94% of adults who have prayed in at least once in the last three months choose to do it by themselves. Not only are most prayers solo practice, 77% of churches never gather together to pray. But the vast majority are often silent also. So I have a challenge for you. You see, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' prayer, to the apostles' teaching, to sharing, to, to koinonia, to the, the, the bread or the reminders of communion and to prayer. So I have a challenge for you this week. In your phone, you have names called contacts. Choose two people. Choose two. Remember, five minutes of word, five minutes of the word, 15 minutes of devotion this week, three times. Choose two people this week. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm compiling this. Two people. Send them a prayer. Not, not the words, hey, I'm praying for you, because that's not praying for them. That's, that's our answer of, I don't really want to deal with somebody else's trouble. I'll just say that word. But send them a prayer. I can't tell you how many guys on a weekly basis that I'm texting back and forth with, not just saying, hey, I'm praying for you, but praying with them via text. It's a great tool. I can't tell you how many guys have, have responded to me with prayers. And you know what it does for me? It lifts my spirit and reminds me that I'm not in this world alone and I'm not in this faith alone and I'm not in this walk alone. That's the idea. That's why they devoted themselves to this, because of this idea of being together. So I'm going to challenge you. Pick two people this week. Pick two people. Why? Because the book of Acts says it, and so I want to be responsible to do it, to, to be devoted to the prayer. So pick two people this week. Wherever you're at, it could just be simple. Hey, I want to let you know, dear Jesus, today I pray with so-and-so. I just want to lift them up before you, God. I don't know what their week looks like, but I want together and join with you to bless them this week. How easy is that? John Maxwell says it this way, everybody desires to be somebody's somebody. Who are you going to make your somebody this week? Watch what it does, not just to them, but watch the return of the relationship and how it grows and how you create this bond together. They devoted themselves to that. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Together they devoted themselves. Why? Because we're living in a crazy time with a crazy government. I was just in California. I can tell you how crazy the government is with a crazy movement of God, and I can imagine they felt the same things today you and I feel. Stress, anxiety, being overwhelmed. Fear. That's why they devoted to prayer, because they positionally reminded themselves that God, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. Matter of fact, I need somebody else to come alongside me, get behind me and pray with me so that they can help bolster my faith to say, God, we trust you. We, we've sang this song, man, you still move mountains. Paul says it this way, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything through complaining, make your petitions known before God. No, no, no. Do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation, by prayer, petition, same thing, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and a peace of God 
which will transcend all understanding, will guard your what? Your heart. Why? Because my heart is the first thing that turns away from God when, when I'm stressed and anxious. It will guard my heart. It will guard me. It will bring me back to the apostles' teaching that says, where God is, my eye cannot fail. I love it. I love it. If you read the passage in Acts, and I'm going to encourage you to read through the book of Acts. So if you want to do three minutes a day or five minutes a day, three times a week, start reading the book of Acts like we're going through right now. I love it. They prayed. They prayed. Ten days. Peter stands up, speaks for ten minutes. Three thousand people find Jesus. What we do is we preach for ten days, pray for ten minutes, and three people. As a matter of fact, I wish you probably think I should only preach for ten minutes. And three people come. I think we got the numbers mixed up a little bit, folks. The passage continues. And many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. Tongues, fire, healing. God was attesting and proclaiming the gospel with signs and wonders. Does he still do that today? Absolutely. But I'm going to tell you, it might look a little different. If you had fire on your head right now, I might run to put it out. Let's just be honest. Hairspray. But God still does miracles. He still does them on a regular occasion. Forgiveness is a miracle. Love is a miracle. Unity is a miracle. Healings is a miracle. Peace is a miracle. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, mercy, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is a miracle. It's a byproduct of what God can do in me and through me. It's not something I can manifest on my own. I can't be peaceful on my own. Left to my own devices, I'm a rageful individual. Left my own devices, I'm not in control. You see, but that's the miracle of Jesus. He says, I'm bringing the Holy Spirit, which happened in Acts 1 and 2. I'm bringing the Holy Spirit to come upon you and live inside you so that you can produce these things externally because I'm producing them internally when you depend on me. The Lord added to their numbers, the passage goes on in verse 7. Praising God and having favor with all people. Now check this out. I love what it says there. Praising God. All these things happened, right? They shared, they gave, they remembered. Praising God and having favor on all people. Does it say people who believed what they believed? No, it says all people. Why does it say all people? Because our world and our country and our communities and your family members maybe even are longing to be part of a community that knows people are loved for who they are, not what they can be, or not what they have been, but where they're at today. It was attractive to all people. You see, this is countercultural, and it's still a message of, that's countercultural today, right? Our culture says, get what you get. Go for yours. And God's culture says, no, 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 don't go for yours. Give yours. And watch what I do through the giving of yours. You'll get something, but you're going to get these things. You're going to get peace. You're going to get goodwill. You're going to get favor. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. Not once in a while, not occasionally, but daily. Daily. He would bring them because he could trust that they were devoted to his causes and people would get healthy and they'd become family. I love that. Let me ask you a question. Does God trust your devotion enough to him, to the scripture, to bring people who need healing into your life? If you look at your life and you're like, man, I, you know, God's not bringing anybody you know, to me that I can lead to him, maybe he doesn't sense your devotion enough. Maybe he's like, man, if you would just listen to what I have to say, I've got so much I want to do in you and through you, and I can trust you then to bring others who are sick, who need healing, who need saving. That's evangelism. All these things um, substantiated by the message. We have a group of people devoted to, to a message. They will suffer for the message. They will give of themselves for the message so that they could share in the joy of the results of the message. I don't know about you, but I love it. I love it when I hear stories of people getting well at our church. I love it. I get to share in that joy. It wasn't my work. It wasn't anything I did. But what I get to do is I get to share in the joy of someone else. How awesome is that? Because we all have this one mission in mind. 
with all this, this, this idea. You see, they no longer lived for themselves, but they gave of themselves. They were so joyful that they didn't need money. They didn't need possessions. Isn't that countercultural to America? They didn't need these things to feel joy. When they believed so strongly in what they did for God was going to be characterized in the presence of God showing up wherever they went. So this morning as we close, I just want to ask you a simple question. Are you devoted or are you associated? It's an easy question. Maybe you've been associated to the message, to the mission of Christ. Maybe, maybe this morning the Holy Spirit is working on your heart and saying, man, maybe you're not so devoted to the, to the words of the apostles. Maybe you're not so devoted to sharing what you have. Maybe you're not so devoted to putting your positional relationship back in a reminder. Maybe you're not so, just so devoted to praying and speaking and spending time with myself and with others. And your life will reflect it because there's no gladness in you. Today, make a choice. Start by being devoted to the apostles' teaching. Commit just for a couple days. I say this often when it comes to tithing. Tithe for three weeks. If God hasn't blessed you, we'll give you your money back. And we'll double it. To an extent. I say the same thing with prayer. I say the same thing with reading the word. Do it. What do you got to lose? I'm, uh, nothing. What do you have to gain? Everything. Everything. You see, that's devoted. Devoted says, I'm going to make a choice. I'm not just going to open up my Weight Watchers app as I'm sitting at dinner, but I'm going to study what I'm supposed to do so that when the time comes, when something else comes along that says, I want you to associate with me, I can turn around to that other association, to my Chips Ahoy. Man, these look good. I can turn around to my Chips Ahoy and say, you know what? Can't tempt me. You can't pull me off of what I'm devoted to. Although I'm not on diet, I probably need to be. See, that's the message of Acts 2.42. So how devoted are you? What do you do with someone else's needs? How devoted are you to living this out, to meeting with other people, to worship, to being here? Not because this is church, but because you are church and someone else needs your church. And watch how God will add to our numbers. I want to close with a simple prayer this morning. See, one thing I notice about this is why do we stop becoming devoted to something? It's because the newness and the challenge wears off. That's why. I mean, I, 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 uh, or we get hurt, or we get injured. Years ago, uh, many, 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 many years ago, I decided that I was going to train for a marathon. And uh, I, I was doing fantastic. I was following this program. I was doing a great job. I was running a lot. And I was out on a long run. I was out on a 16-mile run that day. Believe it or not, this body can move 16 miles. And uh, I was out on a long run. The marathon was about a week and a half, two weeks away. And uh, I was out on a long run. I had one more long run, a 20-mile run to go. And then I was done for my training. And I would have been able to enjoy the, 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 the fruits of the marathon the next two weeks later. And I'm out on a long run. And I get to a point, and I'm far away from my house. I uh, should have thought about that better. And uh, I pull my Achilles, right? Two weeks before I'm set to do something I had dreamed about doing, that I trained for, that I had sacrificed for, that I had devoted myself for, and devoted myself to something meant I had to sacrifice other things. So my family also was part of that sacrifice, unfortunately, because it takes a lot of time to do stuff like that. Unless, you know, but me, it only took like 10 minutes to run, you know, five miles. Not true. 12 minutes a mile. So it took time, it took the diet, it took energy, it took money because I had to buy nice shoes, it took, it took all this stuff I needed to sacrifice. And yet I didn't get to relish in the victory. And I was really disappointed and I was upset about that. And I remember that thinking, man, I, I don't, I don't, why even bother doing this again? Obviously I just can't do it. And, and, and to this day I haven't. I'm not going to say it to you I'm a world class runner because I'm not. We all know that. But I will tell you this, as I reflected upon that time, I remembered myself thinking to myself, but I didn't lose anything. I didn't finish what I thought was the goal, but I didn't lose anything. I gained discipline. I gained victory every day that I chose to get up and do something that I was not normally accustomed nor wanted to do. That alone was victory. 
And I'll say it to you today, church. Every day you decide to get up and say, I'm going to do what Acts 2.42 says. I'm going to choose to be devoted to this. I'm going to choose to give to somebody. I'm going to choose to remember my position with you. And I'm going to choose to be in conversation with you. Every day I choose to do that. Guess what it is? Victory. You see, we have this long-term view of what I'll get down the road. And God says, I don't have long-term. He says, day by day by day, I add it to their numbers. You see, tomorrow morning when you wake up, and if you choose to apply this message, God is going to say to you, today is victory for you. And I've got something I'm going to give you, and I'm going to use you in a different way than I ever have. That's the victory. And day by day, the church will grow. So I think this, I think that what happens is, and we're going to stand up in a second here, and we're going to join in a prayer together. I think what happens is that we forget what it's like to need something, to be something, to experience something. And so that's why we stop being devoted to something. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to pray a prayer from Psalm 51, 12. And if it's you this morning, maybe your devotion to God, maybe your devotion to, to living out what the book of Acts says, maybe your devotion to, to, to who God wants you to be and what you have to give, maybe it's waned a little bit. Maybe it's, it's been tempted and associated with something else because something else has taken that position. The only way I know is to pray a prayer. I think we have it on the board, yeah? Maybe not. Psalm 51:12. And just repeat after me. And we're going to close with this. It says, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Would you pray that with me? Father, restore. Restore. One more time. Restore. And then the next part of that passage says, And make me willing to obey. That's devotion. Make me willing to obey. So, Father, today, Lord, as we go out of these doors, we, the church, as we take church with us wherever we go, because we have the Holy Spirit residing in us, that we are the temple, would you help restore the joy of my salvation so that when I see others, I will be willing to live out what you've asked me to live out. Would you restore to me my devotion first? And Lord, it's only through my obedience. So would you call into places in my life that I've not obedient? Father, we pray that. Lord, I pray that there's somebody here today that says, I've never been devoted to Jesus. I've only been devoted to myself. I know who he is. I associate with him but I've never been devoted to him. If that's you this morning, would you just pray a simple prayer with me and just say this, God, today I'm devoted to you. I don't want to associate anymore. I want to give you my all. Yeah. Father, today, uh, would, you, would, you, would you bless us as we go? Would you restore joy into our salvation of what it means to be saved and how the first believers, how when a mighty wind blew through it, they knew it. They experienced it. God, would you bring a mighty wind again? Father, would that wind flow like it says in Acts 2, that the, the doors flung open as these doors will fling open a minute and that the Spirit of God came through like the sound of a mighty wind and they felt the presence of God as we go out in this world. Will we be your wind today? Will people experience the presence of God because we choose to live in obedience to your word? Father, we thank you for that. We love you. We say amen, 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 amen. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast. I really hope God moved in your heart today. And if you're in the Scottsdale area, I'd love for you to come and visit our campus on one of our Sunday services. You can find details to our service times on our website. I also want to thank our faithful givers. By giving towards our podcast, you're able to help us reach people from all over the world for Christ and fulfill the mission of Oasis, which is to love God, love life, and love people. God bless.